What you are about to see and hear is the gospel. The real gospel, not some watered down counterfeit. This is the gospel of Yeshua, the Messiah, the son of Yahweh. The Old Testament ended with Malachi promising that God, Yahweh, would send a special messenger to prepare us for the Messiah. Isaiah, too, predicted that there would be a voice crying in the wilderness to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. That voice would be telling people to clear the path for Yahweh's promised one. John the Baptist was that voice out in the wilderness of Judea where he called on people to change. John would cover them with water as a symbol of forgiveness, but only if he felt that they were sincere about wanting to change. People from Jerusalem and other small towns all over Judea came to him, admitting their sins and asking to be baptized in water as a symbol of their desire to change. And John, you should have seen him. He wore camel hair for clothes and had a leather loincloth. He literally ate bugs, covered with wild honey to make them taste better. Listen, he's preaching now. You see this water? It's all I have to represent Yahweh's forgiveness. But the one I have been sent to proclaim, what he has is so much better than this. I'm not even worthy to be his servant, helping him to remove his sandals. This one who is coming will baptize you in a completely different way. He will do it with the actual spirit of Yahweh. So one day, along comes Yeshua from Nazareth, a town in the most northern part of Israel, the part which is called Galilee. Yeshua asked John to baptize him with water. Then, when Yeshua came up out of the water, Yahweh opened John's eyes to what real baptism is all about. John literally saw Yahweh's spirit coming down on Yeshua from heaven, like a bird, just settling down all over him. Then he heard an audible voice coming from heaven. You are my son. I see nothing to forgive in you because you have done everything I ever told you to do. And just like that, Yahweh's spirit led Yeshua off into a desert place all by himself. He was there for 40 days, tempted by Satan and surrounded by various dangerous animals. But Yahweh's angelic messengers were there too, and they took care of him. Sometime later, John was put in prison and Yeshua returned to Galilee, where he started telling people that it was time for something that he called Yahweh's kingdom to be revealed. He told everyone that they needed to change and that they needed to believe the gospel that he was preaching. The gospel or the good news about this whole new world, which was radically different to any other kingdom on earth. One day, as he walked along the beach on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Yeshua saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, out in a boat trying to catch fish with a net. Hey Simon, Andrew, come with me and I'll teach you how to catch men instead of fish. Just like that, they left their nets and the boat and followed him. Not far from there, he saw two more brothers, James and John. They too were in a boat on land with their father Zebedee and with some other workers repairing nets. Hey, psst, James, John, come with me. And just like that, they left their father all alone in the boat with his employees. <laughs> you should have seen him. No wonder Yeshua later called that pair the sons of thunder. Together they went into town, into Capernaum. It was the Sabbath day, so there were people at the synagogue. Yeshua entered the synagogue and started teaching them. What he said amazed everyone. It was obvious that he really knew what he was talking about, not like the other religious leaders who were full of empty talk and bluff. In the same synagogue there was a man with a bad spirit in him. The spirit knew who Yeshua was, and it also knew that Yeshua was going to drive him out of the man. No! Go away! Leave us alone! Are you going to destroy us? Back off, or we'll tell the people who you are! You're not just some guy from Nazareth. 
You now a special messenger. Hey, everyone, did you know that- Shut your mouth and come out of him. Ah, no, let me go. Help, help, help. Look at that. The bad spirit is gone. How did he do it? It's more than just theory for this guy. He was shouting nonsense earlier. Now he's cool as a cucumber. Just like that, his fame spread all over the region. On leaving the synagogue, the five of them, Yeshua, Peter, Andrew, James and John, went to Simon's house. But as it turned out, Simon's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. Simon and his wife told Yeshua about her being sick. Yeshua took the old woman by the hand and helped her out of bed. As he did that, the fever stopped. Then, immediately, she started doing all that she could to make things comfortable for the others. That night after sunset, many sick people and people with bad spirits were brought to him. The house was packed and people could not even get through the door. Yeshua healed many of them and he drove out the bad spirits that were in so many of the people. But he stopped them from saying anything because they knew who he was. Yeshua did not want to let the general public know just yet. Very early the next morning, before the sun was up, Yeshua went out where he could be alone and pray. Later, Simon and the others came and joined him. Lord, some people was coming around this morning wanting to see you. You ought to go out there and talk to them. No, Simon. It's time to move on. I need to preach in other towns too, not just this one. So Yeshua preached from synagogue to synagogue throughout all of Galilee, and he drove out bad spirits wherever he went. One day, a leper came begging Yeshua to heal him. The beggar fell on his knees in front of him. I know you can heal me if you want to. Please, can you help me? Please! Yeshua was moved with compassion for the man. Oh, I do want to heal you. There, you are clean now. And instantly, the leprosy left. He was healed. Listen, this is very important. Don't tell anyone about this. Just go to the priest with a gift like it says in our laws and ask him to verify that you've been healed. But don't tell him how it happened. Instead, the leper went out and blabbed it all over the place so that Yeshua could no longer walk openly in the town. From that time on, Yeshua was forced to mostly hide out in deserted places where people who really wanted to see him could come and find him on their own. Sometime later, Yeshua sneaked back into town, but it wasn't long before half of Capernaum knew he was there and the house was packed to overflowing again. Yeshua was inside preaching to the people when four men arrived outside with a paralyzed man on a stretcher. There was no way through the crowd, so they carried the men up onto the flat roof and they started tearing up the tiles. When they had made a big enough hole in the ceiling, they lowered the stretcher down with the paralyzed man on it. Despite the damage, Yeshua was impressed by their faith and he said to the sick man, I forgive you for this and for any other sins that you have done. Some religious expert there heard it and they grumbled in their hearts. What blasphemy! He can't forgive sins. Only Yahweh can do that. Yeshua had a pretty good idea what they were thinking. So he said, What's the real reason you're upset? Anyone can say that someone's sins have been forgiven. But could you tell this man to get up and take his stretcher home with him? Now I'm going to show you that I have the right to forgive sins. Then Yeshua turned to the paralyzed man. Go ahead, get up. Now, pick up your stretcher, and now carry it home with you. Right there and then, the healed man did as he was told in front of everyone. It startled them all, and it was clear to everyone that it was Yahweh who made it all possible. He really did have the right to forgive sins. I'm telling you, none of us here has ever seen anything like this before. Never. Yeshua later left the house and went down by the beach. More crowds gathered, and he taught them too. Somewhere along the way, he came upon Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at a table, collecting taxes for the Roman armies. 
Hey, come with me, Matthew. Well, what do you know? Matthew got up and followed him too, just like that, without hesitation. One evening, back at the house, Yeshua was having dinner, and several tax collectors and other disreputable sorts were there with him and his disciples. The usual religious leaders took note that he was eating with such people, and they approached some of Yeshua's disciples. Why does he do that? What does he see in such people? Doesn't he know that they're bad people? Who needs a doctor the most? Sick people? Or those who are well? I'm not here to flatter those who think they're better than others. I'm here to help the ones who know they need to change. Followers of John the Baptist, like so many other religious people of the day, would often fast. At that time, some of these religious people approached Yeshua. We show that we want to change by fasting. And John's followers do the same. But your people are not even fasting. Look at them. Do people fast at a wedding party? That would be an insult to the groom. They're happy for the groom, and so they celebrate with him. But there is coming a time when the groom will be taken away. That'll be soon enough to start fasting. If you try to stitch new cloth onto a worn out garment, it'll just make the whole worse because the old cloth is too weak to hold together with the patch. And you don't put new wine into old wineskins. If you do, as the wine ferments, the expansion will burst those hard old skins and the wine will be lost. No, when you have something that is really new, really different, you need people who are not happy with the old ways to help get you started. One Sabbath, Yeshua and his disciples were gleaning grain from a field as they walked through it. And again, the starchy old religious leaders took offense. Don't you have any respect for the Sabbath? Harvesting is not allowed on rest days. Well, how about this one? When David and his men were hungry, they went into the house of Yahweh and ate the sacred bread. That was against the Torah too. Yet David took enough for himself and his men as well. You see, the Sabbath law was made to keep employers from oppressing their workers. The Sabbath was never intended to make life harder for people. When you get the spirit of what I'm saying, you will be able to see through the commandment to the intention or spirit that was behind it in the first place. There was a similar incident that happened on another Sabbath, this time in the local synagogue. A man was there with a crippled hand. Those who followed the Torah watched Yeshua to see if he would heal the man on the Sabbath so that they could make yet another accusation against him. Stand up. Does the Torah tell us to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? Is it better to help someone or to hurt them? <laughs> they were speechless. But Yeshua was furious. How could they be so callous? Then he turned back to the crippled man. Give me your hand. And instantly the man's hand was healed, as good as his other one. That is when these so-called defenders of the Torah started conspiring with Jews, who were followers of the so-called Jewish king, Herod. They wanted help from these people to get Yeshua stopped. Yeshua left the synagogue and returned to the beach, where people from towns all around Galilee, as well as many from Judea, from the other side of the Jordan River, and from Lebanon and Syria, came to listen to him. They had all heard about the great things that he had done. Can you get one of your friends to loan us a boat? That way I can speak from the boat. We're going to be crushed if I stay here. Sick people in particular pressed against him because so many others had already been healed and they wanted to be healed too. People with bad spirits also knelt down before him, declaring that he was the son of Yahweh. Look, there is someone doing that now. I know who you are. You're the son of... That's enough. This is not the time for such talk. Now shut up, you troublemaking spirit, and leave her. Then Yeshua started climbing up a steep mountain. Only his true followers made the effort to climb with him. There were 12 in all. He commissioned them both to preach with him and to preach separately on his behalf. He also empowered them to heal sicknesses and to drive out bad spirits. 
The first one was Simon, whom he renamed Peter. Then there were James and John, whom he nicknamed the Sons of Thunder because of their father Zebedee. The other nine were Peter's brother Andrew, Matthew and his brother, the other James, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas, the one who later betrayed him. They returned to the house, which, of course, meant more crowds of people. The crowds kept Yeshua so busy that it was impossible for him and his disciples to even have a meal by themselves. Some of his friends literally dragged Yeshua away from the crowds for fear that he was about to have a nervous breakdown. Religious leaders from Jerusalem had joined the crowd, and they said that Yeshua had only been able to cast out evil spirits because he himself had an evil spirit one that was more powerful than all the other evil spirits that he was driving out. An evil spirit, you say? You think I have an evil spirit? Why would one evil spirit cast out another evil spirit? Any king that was silly enough to declare war on himself would be useless. The same is true of any family that turns on itself. Such division is sure recipe for failure. The day Satan declares war on himself, he will be defeated without any help from outside himself. No, no. The only thing that will defeat a strong man is an even stronger one. It takes something stronger than Satan to drive out Satan as I have done. Yahweh is able and willing to forgive every sin that has ever been committed. But whenever someone is fighting against the spirit of Yahweh itself, whether in this life or in the next, they make it impossible for Yahweh to forgive them. You will never find forgiveness while you do that. Instead, you put yourself at risk of eternal damnation. He said all that because they had accused him of having an evil spirit when they knew in their own hearts that this was not true. About the same time, his mother and his brothers arrived and they were standing outside the house, asking for him to come out. Someone passed the message on to Yeshua. Hey, your mother and brothers are outside, wanting to see you. My mother and my brothers? <laughs> Who are my real mothers and brothers? See here, these are my mother and my brothers. My family are those who do Yahweh's will. They are my real mother and my real brothers and sisters. Back on the beach, the crowds had grown larger, all of them wanting to hear Yeshua teach. So he stood in a big boat, and the crowd stood at the edge of the water while he taught. In his teaching, he would often tell stories to illustrate what he wanted to say. Listen, a farmer was sowing seeds, and some of them fell on the road. Birds came and ate them. Some fell on rocky ground with very little dirt. They sprouted quickly, but there was not enough soil for roots to develop. When the sun came up, it scorched the plants and they withered away. Some fell among weeds and the weeds choked the plants so that they never produced any fruit. But others fell on good ground. They sprouted, grew and produced fruit, some 30 times more than the original seed, some 60 and some a hundred. Can you hear what I'm saying? If you can, then you need to think seriously about what it means for you personally. When the crowd had left, a few stragglers, who had stayed back with him and the twelve, asked about the parable. I'm going to tell you some secrets about the invisible kingdom that I'm building, but it will all just be weird stories to those who are not meant to understand it. Like one of the prophets said, they will see and hear, but they will not understand because they don't want to change and they refuse to see their need for forgiveness. Okay, so you're having a problem with understanding this story? I'll help you so that you can get a better idea of how to understand all of my stories. What the farmer was sowing are my teachings. The road on which the seeds fell is like people who start to listen, but then they let the devil distract them from my teachings and the rocky ground are people who get excited about what they hear. But they are shallow and emotional. As soon as they face a little opposition or discomfort because of what I've told them, they get offended and give up. Then there are those who are full of weeds. They hear me and grow, 
but are just too damn busy with all the business of the world, with the deceitfulness of wanting to make money, and with their love for other things besides listening to me. All of these weeds choke the words which I have spoken, and so these people never bear genuine spiritual fruit. But now, look at the ones who are good ground. They too hear my teachings and receive them, but they do more than that. They act on what they have heard, and so they grow until they eventually produce fruit, some more than others. That's how it always is with the truth. It needs to be shared. You don't buy a candle to stick it under your bed or to throw it into a box to be forgotten. You buy a candle so you can put it on a candle holder. Then everyone can see the light. Sooner or later, the truth will be known. Whether you are children of the light or whether you are just fakes, every secret will be brought out into the open. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you do, then start acting like you've heard me. What you do with what I have said will make all the difference in whether or not I show you more. If you use what I tell you, I'll give you more. But if you do not act on it, I'll take away from you what little truth you already have. Yeshua explained how truth will just naturally grow if we are faithful with it. This kingdom that I'm building is like a man planting seeds. Day after day, he sees the seeds growing, almost magically. Everything that the plant needs is present there in the seeds, right from the start. It sprouts up out of the ground, then branches appear, and then a crop appears on the branches. It all happens quite naturally. All the farmer has to do in the end is just reap the harvest. How best can I illustrate for you this new, invisible world of faith that I'm building? It's like a tiny seed. A mustard seed, for example. The mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds in the garden, but then it grows up into a bigger plant than all of the other spices. The mustard plant sends out branches that can give shade enough for birds to walk under it. Yeshua told many other similar stories in an effort to communicate his message to those who were able to hear what he was saying. He rarely said anything without such illustrations, and he would explain them privately when he was alone with those who truly believed him. That same evening, he suggested that they cross the lake in a boat. There were several boats all travelling together, so they got into one of them after they had sent the crowd away. But out on the sea, a fierce storm arose, causing waves to swamp the boat. Yeshua was in the back of the ship, sleeping on a pillow. Hey, Yeshua, wake up. We're about to drown. How can you sleep at a time like this? Peace! Do you hear me? Be still! Now, what were you so worried about? Don't you have any faith? Did you hear that? Did you see that? He told the wind to stop, and it did. Yeah, and even the waves obeyed him. They soon reached the other side of the lake, landing near a cemetery in the country of the Gadarenes. A crazed man with unclean spirits met them on the beach. He'd been living among the tombs, completely out of control. Attempts had been made to tie him up or to chain him, but he had escaped the ropes and he had even broken the chains. Day and night he would roam the hills and wander through the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with sharp stones. But when he saw Yeshua in the distance, he ran to meet him and he worshipped him. That is when the many evil spirits inside of him shouted at Yeshua. Stay away from me, you! You Yeshua! I know you are! You're the son! You're the son of the, the Almighty God! Please! Yahweh doesn't need to destroy us! Can't you just leave us alone? Come out of him, you filthy evil spirits! Ah, ah, stop torturing us! What is your name? Tell me! We have many names, but there are thousands of us. Please, don't send us back to where we came from, please! Send us to those pigs instead! There was a huge herd of pigs that fed in those hills, so Yeshua let them have what they wanted. After all, Jews were forbidden to raise pigs anyway. 
So the demons flew out of the man and into the pigs, about two thousand of them. And the pigs stampeded down a steep incline into the lake where they drowned. The people who owned the pigs were furious. They ran into the city, telling everyone they met what had happened. Soon a crowd had gathered at the cemetery to see for themselves what was going on. There was the crazy man, perfectly sane now, with clothes on, sitting calmly with Yeshua. Ironically, this frightened them more than the man had frightened them when he was crazy. The pig owners explained what had happened in more detail, especially noting that all of their pigs had been destroyed, and the crowd started shouting for Yeshua to leave the whole area. Yeshua went peacefully back to his boat, and the once crazy man tried to come with him. No, I'm sorry, friend. You can't come with us. You see, I have a special job for you. I want you to go back to your former friends and tell them what I've done because of my love for you. The man left and did as he was told. He faithfully proclaimed his story to people from ten different towns over the ensuing days, also telling the crowds where Yeshua could be found. People who heard his story were so amazed that many of them ran and walked to meet Yeshua on the beach at the other side of the lake. One of the people who came to see Yeshua was a rabbi named Jairus. He fell at Yeshua's feet in desperate prayer. Please, master, please! My little girl is dying. Come and touch her so that she will be healed. I beg you. Yeshua agreed to go with him to see the little girl. But there was such a huge crowd that it slowed him down considerably. Jairus's faith was being tested by the delay. In the crowd was a woman who had been losing blood for twelve long years. She had spent all that she had on doctors who tried one thing after another, but the bleeding only became worse. When she heard about Yeshua, she pushed through the congregation and managed to touch his robe. She had believed that she would only need to touch him and she would be healed. Sure enough, the bleeding stopped. Just like that, and she knew in herself that she had been healed. Yeshua, knowing that power had flowed from his body to hers, turned around and said, "Who did that? Who touched my robe? Are you kidding? Look at this crowd. They was all touching you. What do you mean, who touched me?" But Yeshua continued to look for the woman until she fell down before him, fearing that she was going to be in trouble for what she had done. I, I'm sorry. I was desperate. I needed help so badly. My dear, don't be afraid. It was your faith that made you well. This is what I'm looking for in everyone. Go your way and enjoy your newfound health. Just then, Jairus, I'm so sorry, Rabbi, but I have bad news from your family. Your daughter's died. Don't bother the teacher any further. It's too late. Don't believe him. Trust me. I know what I'm talking about. Turning to the crowd, the rest of you stay here. Peter, James, John, you three come with me and Jairus. The rest of you don't follow us. When the five of them reached the house, there was a racket coming from all the professional mourners who were there to console the family. What's all this fuss about? The little girl is not dead. She has only fallen asleep. <laughs> Outside, all of you, get out. Only the parents were allowed to come with Yeshua and his three followers into the room where the little girl was lying. Talita, Kumi, my child, it is time to wake up. Wow, that's amazing! Praise Yahweh! Oh, honey, we were so worried about you. Praise the Lord! Now listen to me very carefully. I don't want you to breathe a word about this to anyone. As far as your daughter is concerned, she was never dead. She just passed out, and now she has recovered. You tell no one. Do you understand? Now give her something to eat. She needs nourishment. The girl, by the way, was 12 years old. Born the same year that the woman Yeshua healed on the way had first suffered from her bleeding disorder, Yeshua gradually worked his way westward from the lake back to his hometown of Nazareth. His real followers traveled with him. On the Sabbath, 
He went to the synagogue in Nazareth to teach. Many of his old friends and neighbors were there, and they were surprised at the great wisdom in what he said, on top of what they had already heard about his miracles. But they were not surprised in a good way. Is this really Mary and Joseph's son? His brothers James, Joseph Jr., Jude, and Simon? They don't talk or act like this, and his sisters are all quite normal. So who does he think he is? It is like this for any prophet. Strangers gladly listen to the message, but the prophet's family, his neighbors, and his friends cannot hear the message because all they see is the messenger, and they're not impressed. Apart from healing a few sick people there, Yeshua could not do any impressive miracles while in Nazareth. He was deeply disturbed by their refusal to believe what he had been sent to tell them. Consequently, Yeshua branched out into other, more remote villages. He divided his 12 most faithful followers into pairs and sent them off on their own to see how they would go. He gave them power to drive out unclean spirits and he gave them strict instructions on how to conduct themselves as well. Don't take anything for your journey apart from a walking stick. No cash or other form of money, no food, and only one pair of shoes and one coat apiece. When you enter a village, find the most worthy person to stay with, and do not switch from their house to some other house. If things turn sour between you and your host, just leave. Shake the dust off your shoes on leaving the town as a demonstration against them. I'm telling you that Yahweh will go easier on Sodom and Gomorrah on Judgment Day than He will on any town that rejects you. So they went out and preached that the people needed to change. They freed people from bad spirits. They treated sicknesses with oil. And overall, they healed a lot of people. The Hebrew king, Herod, heard about Yeshua. By this time, there was talk about him everywhere. It must be John, the baptizer. Who else could do such things? Hmm, he's come back to haunt me. No, it's Elijah. Come to prepare us for the Messiah. Maybe he's just a new prophet, a very special one. I still say it's John, whose head I cut off. He has come back from the dead. You see, John had earlier criticized Herod for stealing his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, from him. And Herodias hated John for it. It was only as a favor to Herodias that Herod had arrested John in the first place. Herodias wanted Herod to kill John, but Herod had refused. He knew that John was a holy man. And he himself often spent time with John at the prison, listening to the things that John had to say. Herod had too much respect for John to kill him. But on his birthday, Herod threw a big party for all the most influential people in Galilee. And Herodias' daughter danced for the guests. Herod and the guests were so impressed by her that he offered publicly to do anything she asked, even up to giving her half of his kingdom as a gift. She consulted with her mother. Mom, what should I ask for? Ask him for the head of John the Baptist. She ran straight into the hall where Herod was sitting and made her announcement. I want you to give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Herod was crushed. Too late, he realized his mistake in making such a promise. But because he did not want to be seen as having broken his promise, he gave in to her demand. Send the executioner to cut off John's head and bring it to me. The executioner went to the prison and did as he had been told. He brought the head on a platter and gave it to the girl, who gave it to her mother. When John's followers heard about this, they came for the rest of his body and laid it in a tomb. But back to the disciples whom Yeshua had sent out on their own, they gathered together on their return to share stories about what they had done and about what they had been teaching while on their journeys. There are too many people coming and going here. It's a struggle just to get time to eat. Come with me to a place where we can be alone and spend the day resting. They tried to sneak off in a boat to a deserted beach, but people saw them and ran on foot around the lake, gathering others along the way. Consequently, a crowd was already waiting for Yeshua when the boat dropped anchor. Yeshua, rather than being angry with the people, had pity on them. 
because he saw them as confused sheep with no one to lead them. So he dropped his earlier plans for rest and privacy and taught them for most of the day. That afternoon, It's getting late and there ain't no shops here. They haven't ate all day. Send them away so they can go to a village and buy some before the stores close. Why don't you feed them? What? A year's wages won't be but just enough to buy a little for all of them. Well, how much do you have? Go and see. When they returned, There ain't but five loaves of bread. That's it. Oh, and two fish. Okay, get them to sit on the grass in groups of 50 to 100 each. The disciples did as they were told. And then Yeshua took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven, then blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to be given to the people. He divided the two fish between everyone as well. And before the day was through, they had all eaten their fill. On top of that, 12 baskets were filled with the leftovers. In all, there were about 5,000 people who were fed that day. After instructing his disciples to get into a boat and go across the lake to Bethsaida, Yeshua quickly sent the crowd away. When everyone was gone, he finally had time to be alone, so he climbed up into the rocks to pray. That night, the ship was out in the lake and Yeshua was alone on the land. He could see them struggling to row the boat with the wind against them. At about 3 a.m., Yeshua came strolling by on top of the water as though he was going to walk right past them. When they saw it, they thought it must be a ghost and they all cried out in fear. But Yeshua called out casually to them. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's me. Aren't you happy to see me? He climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. Words cannot describe how impressed they were by what had happened. But it was really no more miraculous than the feeding of the 5,000. Yet they had already forgotten about that miracle. This time they landed at Gennesaret and the public there recognized Yeshua as soon as he left the ship. So once again, there were people being carried in beds to wherever he was likely to be. They all wanted to be healed. In the cities and villages, and even on country roads, sick people would be placed on the ground, waiting for him to arrive and heal them. And as many as he touched, he healed. One day, a deputation of religious leaders from Jerusalem came to investigate what was going on. They were shocked to see that Yeshua and his disciples did not even wash their hands before eating. It is Jewish custom to be very strict about cleanliness, especially with eating. Even just going out to the markets requires them to wash their hands. There are many other rules too about how to clean their cups and pots and other food containers and how to clean the tables on which they ate. Why do your disciples disregard our teachings about cleanliness? They are eating without washing their hands. The prophet Isaiah must have had you guys in mind when he wrote, These people say they love me, but their hearts say otherwise. Their worship is a farce because they teach man-made rules and not what I have said. They ignore the commandments of Yahweh and focus instead on traditions. Traditions like washing pots and cups and other things, which is what you are doing now. I'll give you another example of your disobedience. Moses said to take care of your parents and if you curse father or mother, you should be executed. But you say that people can ignore their parents and call such indifference a sacrifice to Yahweh. You say that they are under no further obligation to care for their parents. Do you see how your man-made rules have contradicted what Yahweh said about caring for parents in their old age? Then he addressed the crowd. Listen, all of you, and understand. There is nothing that goes into the body that will make you evil. What makes you evil comes out of you, out of your evil thoughts. If you have ears, use them. Try to understand what I'm saying. Later, back inside the house, his disciples asked him to explain this comparison between food and evil. Are you so deaf too? Can't you see that nothing you eat is going to make you evil? Food doesn't change the way you think. It just goes into your stomach, through your intestines, and out into the sewer. Spiritually speaking, all food is neutral. But immorality comes from inside of you. Evil thoughts, sexual misconduct, murder, greed, lies, hatred, 
blasphemy, pride and foolishness. These all come from within and that is what defines the difference between good and evil. From there they travelled north, to the border of the countries we now call Syria and Lebanon, hoping to stay at a house there without being spotted. But a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard he was there, and she came and knelt at Yeshua's feet. She was a Greek woman from Syria, and she begged Yeshua to cast the unclean spirit out of her daughter. I've been sent to the children of Israel first. It's not right to take the children's food and feed it to the dogs. Oh yes, Lord, but the dogs still get to eat the crumbs that fall from the table, and that's all I am asking for from you. Fair enough. I'm impressed by your faith and by your humility as well. Because of this, you can go back to your daughter and you will find that she has been healed. Sure enough, when she arrived at her house, she found her daughter lying peacefully on her bed. The bad spirit had left. From the borders of Syria and Lebanon, Yeshua travelled east to the ten cities before returning to the Sea of Galilee. Back in Galilee, a man was brought to him who was deaf and partially dumb. His friends were begging Yeshua to put his hand on the man. Yeshua took him away from the crowd and did something with his finger in the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed. Ephatha, <sighs> open! In that very moment, the man's hearing returned, and the muscles in his tongue did something so that he could speak clearly. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you! Thank you! Please, don't say anything about this to anyone. Can you do that? Look at this! Did you hear what I said? I don't want you telling anyone about what I did. But they just would not stop talking about it. This guy is amazing. He not only healed his hearing, but he fixed this speech as well. I can't wait to tell my wife about this. Sometime after that, Yeshua was in a situation where he had been teaching quite a large crowd for three days straight and they had nothing to eat. Yeshua spoke to his disciples. They've been with me for three days now with nothing to eat. I feel sorry for them. If I send them home now, they may faint on the way. Some of them have come a long distance to be here. Yeah, true. But where are we going to find food out here for so many people? Well, how many loaves do we have left for ourselves? Seven. So Yeshua told everyone to sit down. He took the seven loaves, thanked Yahweh for them, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to share, which they did with all the people. They had a few small fish too, so he blessed the fish and instructed his disciples to do the same thing with them. Everybody ate their fill, and they took up seven baskets full of leftovers, despite there being about 4,000 people. When everyone was full, Yeshua sent them home. Then he left quickly in a ship along with his disciples. This time they sailed to Dalmanutha, on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. In Dalmanutha, he had yet another encounter with some religious leaders. They were pushing for Yeshua to do a miracle, to prove he was from Yahweh. Yeshua was exasperated, and he sighed deeply to express it. <sighs> Why do you keep looking for miracles? Listen to me, I'm not going to give you a miracle, not you or anyone else like you. With that, he left them and headed across the lake once again. Hey, Andrew, have you saw those baskets of food that was left over? No, I thought you had them. I left them on the beach. Oh no, he's gonna be mad about this. You know how he hates us wasting stuff. Well, we have one loaf left at least. I hope you guys are aware of how the religious leaders and political activists can influence us. Like yeast, spreading through a whole loaf of bread. All that talk about miracles can cause us to lose our true purpose. Oh no, I think he knows about the bread. We're in real hot water now. It has nothing to do with bread or the lack of it. Are you so worried about getting into trouble that you can't listen to what I'm actually saying? You have eyes and ears, learn to use them. Do you remember how I used five loaves to feed 5,000 people? How many baskets did we have left after that? Twelve. And then when I used seven loaves to feed 4,000, 
How many baskets full of leftovers did you collect then? Seven. So why is it that you cannot stop worrying about bread long enough to understand what I'm really saying? They disembarked from the ship in a little fishing village called Bethsaida, on the north coast of the Sea of Galilee. This time a blind man was brought to Yeshua to be touched. Yeshua took the blind man by the hand and wandered off out of town with him. When they were alone, he spit on his eyes and put his hands on him. Then he asked if the man could see anything. I can see something like trees, but then moving. Yeshua put his hands on the man's eyes a second time and then had him look up again. This time he could see everything clearly. Now I want you to go straight back to your home. Do not go into town and do not tell anyone in town what has happened. Do you understand? Then Yeshua, along with his disciples, left that place and walked on to a Roman settlement at the base of Mount Hermon called Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking, Yeshua asked his disciples, Who do the people think I am? John the Baptist. Or maybe Elijah. Some just think that you are a new prophet. But who do you think I am? Well, you're the Messiah, of course. Not so loud. Don't be telling that to anyone else. You see, I have to suffer many things first and be rejected by all of the religious leaders. They're going to kill me, but three days later, I'll come back to life. Kill you? Are you mad? Why would they kill you? You're our Messiah. Get away from me, you instrument of the devil. You have no idea about how Yahweh works and thinks. You just think like everyone else. Later, when a crowd had gathered, You want to follow me, do you? Well, this is more than just a walk in the park. You must learn to stop thinking about what you can get out of it and be prepared to face persecution, even martyrdom for me. If you try to save your life, you will lose it. But if you're prepared to lose your life for me and for the sake of our message, you will actually save it for eternity. Get things into perspective. What's the point of selling your soul just to be popular or rich? What could you possibly give in exchange for your soul? Listen to this very closely. Anyone who is ashamed of me and ashamed of what I teach in this selfish and sinful world, I'm going to be ashamed of them when I come in the glory of my Father with all the angels of heaven. What I am about to tell you is absolutely true. Some of you standing here are going to see the power of Yahweh's kingdom before you die, here and now, in this life. Sure enough, six days later, Yeshua led Peter, James and John up into a high mountain, where they sat away from him by themselves and just watched as he was changed in front of them. His robe began to shine. It was as white as snow, whiter than any wool on earth. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and the disciples saw them talking with Yeshua. Lord, uh, thank you so much for letting us see this. Uh, what if we was to make three tents here, one for each of you? Peter was talking nonsense, of course, trying to cover up for the fear that he was experiencing. But a cloud moved over the whole scene, and a voice came out of it. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. And just like that, Elijah and Moses disappeared. All the disciples could see after that was Yeshua alone. As they came down the mountain. You really do have to keep this secret, what you just saw up there, until after I have risen from the dead. For once, someone did do as Yeshua asked, even though they still could not make sense of his reference to rising from the dead. But they did ask more questions in order to gain a better understanding of the order of events. The religious leaders say Elijah was supposed to come first, before you. Well, he did. But as predicted, they did to him what they did. When they reached the other disciples at the base of the mountain, there was a big crowd with them and some religious leaders were questioning the disciples. When the people saw Yeshua and the other three coming, they became quite excited and ran to greet them. Yeshua questioned the religious leaders. So what are you up to? Why are you questioning my friends? I can explain, Master. You see, 
My son has a bad spirit, which has made him unable to speak. Worse than that, it causes him to have fits, foaming at the mouth and grinding his teeth until he just goes limp. I asked your disciples to cure him, but they couldn't. Oh my goodness, how long is it going to take for you guys to get this straight? Where is your faith? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the young man to him. And when he saw Yeshua, he immediately started fitting again, falling on the ground and foaming at the mouth. So tell me, how long has he had this problem? He's had it since he was a young child. Often he's fallen into the fire or into water as it tries to destroy him. If you can do anything, please do it. Please take pity on me. It's all about believing Yahweh. When you have faith in Him, anything is possible. The boy's father started crying in great desperation as his son was showing no signs of being healed. I believe, I believe, but I don't know what to believe. Please help me to have real faith. When Yeshua saw that more people were coming, he shouted at the bad spirit. That's enough, you deaf and dumb spirit. Come out of him and never return again. Even then, the man continued to thrash around for a little while before the bad spirit left him. And then the young man looked like he was dead. Many of the people thought he really was. But Yeshua took him by the hand and helped him as the young man stood to his feet. When they were back in the house, the disciples asked Yeshua privately. Why wasn't we able to cast the bad spirit out? Well, sometimes it just takes a lot more prayer and fasting than other times. From there, they traveled around Galilee for quite a while, trying all the time to keep their whereabouts secret. During this period, Yeshua taught his disciples more about what to expect when they returned to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over to my enemies and they will kill me. But on the third day after they kill me, I will come back to life. Unfortunately, they were all in denial, not able to take it all in. They were afraid to ask further too, for fear of what he might say. Another time, there was an argument between some of the disciples when they were walking back to Capernaum. So, when they were back in the house, Yeshua asked, What was it that you were arguing about out there on the road? No one wanted to answer because they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. So he made sure that all 12 of them were together before saying more. I want to explain something. If you want to impress me, you will do it by showing how humbly you can serve the others. There was a baby there at the time, so Yeshua picked the baby up in his arms and brought it over to where the others were. Anyone who receives a child like this one on my behalf receives me. And anyone who receives me, receives the one who sent me. Then John changed the subject. Teacher, uh, we saw someone casting out bad spirits, and he said he was a follower of you. But we never met him before, so we told him to stop. Oh, you should not have done that. If he really was doing a miracle, and if he wanted to give me credit for it, the chances are that he is a friend and not an enemy. Anyone who does not oppose what I teach must be our friend. If people so much as give you a cup of water because you are teaching what I teach, they will be rewarded for it. But anyone who opposes you because of your faith in me, I say it would be better for them to have a grinding stone hanged around their neck and be dropped into the ocean. If your own hand gets in the way of you serving me, I say cut it off. It is better to go through life without a hand than to be tormented in hell where the fire never ceases and where worms eat your flesh forever. If your foot is what stops you from serving me, then cut that off too. It is better to limp through life with one foot than to be thrown into the fires of hell which never go out, where the worms never die. Finally, if it is your eye that causes you to sin, Poke it out. It is better to enter Yahweh's kingdom with one eye than to finish up in hell where the worms never die and where the fire never goes out. One way or another, you need to be purified. It may be with salt now or it could be with fire later. Has someone robbed you of the salt that you need to hear now? You'd better get it back and then work at making peace with other people. 
It was time for them to head to Jerusalem, so they started south, down the far side of the Jordan River. As usual, people chased after him, and, as usual, he took the opportunity to teach them. Along the way, some more religious leaders wanted to discuss divorce with him in an effort to build a case against him. Is it okay for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses teach in the Torah? Moses said it was okay. As long as the husband put it in writing. Do you know why Moses said that? He knew you were going to dump your wives anyway, whether he agreed or not. So the best he could do was get you to formalize the agreement in writing. But it's not the way Yahweh intends things to be. Yahweh created males and females with the intention that a man would marry and leave his parents permanently. The couple would cease to be two separate people and they would grow to become one life together until death. So I'm telling you that what Yahweh has joined together should not be separated, not even on the basis of some rule you got from Moses. Back in the house, the disciples asked for a further explanation. My rule is that if you divorce your wife for any reason and marry someone else, you are committing adultery by doing that. If a woman does the same thing and then remarries, she is also guilty of committing adultery. Simple as that. Parents were bringing their children to Yeshua, hoping that he would touch them, and his disciples criticized those who did it. But when Yeshua saw it, he was quite upset. Let them come. Don't stop them. We can learn much about Yahweh's kingdom from these little children. In fact, if you do not become like one of them, you will not be allowed into this new kingdom that I am building. So he picked the children up and hugged them, blessing them as had been requested. One day when he was out walking, someone came running after him. The man knelt down in front of Yeshua. Good teacher, I've heard that you can make people live forever. Tell me what I must do to get this. First, you have called me good, but you must understand that no human opinion should come in the way of knowing what Yahweh wants you to do. You have his rules there in the Torah for starters. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not lie, honor your father and mother. But teacher, I've obeyed all these rules from the time I was a child. The man had interrupted before Yeshua could say the last commandment, the one about greed. Yeshua loved him and wanted him to see his need more clearly. Ah, but you've missed one thing, and that is the source of all your problems. You must go and sell everything you have and give to the poor. When you do that, you will have the treasure in heaven that you're looking for. Then you will be free to come die with me. The young man walked away sorrowfully because he had too much wealth to want to give it all up. Then Yeshua looked around at those who were with him. Do you see this? It's like this with anyone who is wealthy. It's not easy for any of them to get into the heavenly kingdom. The disciples were astonished, as this was the first time they had heard him say this. I'll say it again. It is extremely difficult for those who think money will solve their problems to get into the heavenly kingdom that I am building. I would go so far as to say that it would be easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into Yahweh's kingdom. They discussed this amongst themselves, realizing that virtually everyone assumes they need money to live. Was you trying to say that no one can be saved? I am saying that without help from Yahweh, yes, it would be impossible for anyone to be saved. But with Yahweh... There is a way. Then Peter thought back to the day when he started following Yeshua. Aha, I see it now. That is what we did, isn't it? We left everything and started traveling around with you. Exactly. And as a result, even in this life, you've experienced Yahweh's provision day after day. We've stayed in many homes and you've discovered hundreds of spiritual brothers and sisters that you never knew you had just because you were prepared to leave what you had before and come with me. We received persecution too, but in the end, we will have eternal life. Just be careful that you do not become lifted up with pride about this, for some of the first converts may finish up lost, and some of the last to change may be the ones with the most truth in the end. They were still heading toward Jerusalem, 
and Yeshua was walking well ahead of the others, as though he was in a hurry to get there. This surprised the others, because they understood that trouble awaited them all when they arrived. Yeshua had been preparing them by sharing as much as he felt they could take in. So when we reach Jerusalem, someone is going to help the religious leaders capture me, and then the religious leaders will, in turn, get the Romans to execute me. But on the third day after I am executed, I will rise back to life. Much of it still went over their heads, because they still had an unrealistic picture of this coming kingdom. Listen to this request from James and John to get an idea of how selfish they still were. Teacher, can we ask a favor from you? What is it that you want? When you set up your kingdom, can we have the top positions with one of us seated just to the right of you and the other seated just to the left? Oh dear. Do you even know what it means to be great in my kingdom? Can you drink the cup of my suffering and be baptized with everything that I must go through? Oh yes, certainly. Can't we, James? Yes. Yes, Master. We can do that. You may not understand it now, but you will suffer. And one of you will die for me too. But I'm not in a position to say who will sit on my right hand or who will sit on my left. That will be decided later. When word leaked out that they had done this, the other ten disciples were pretty angry with James and John. So Yeshua called them all together and addressed the problem. You know that in the world, being a leader means being able to tell other people what to do. But it's not going to be like that with us. If you want to be great, you have to show it by serving the others. Look at me. I didn't come to be waited on by the rest of you. No. I've tried to serve you and to give my life as payment for the sins of others. Shortly after this, they arrived in Jericho. Along the way, a lot of people had started walking with them. As they were leaving Jericho, on the side of the road, a blind beggar called Tim's son was begging. When Tim's son heard that Yeshua was near, he started shouting, Hey, Yeshua! King David's son! Over here! Please have mercy on me! Yeshua stopped and he ordered someone to call the blind man over. The message was passed on to Tim's son. Get up! He wants to see you. This could be a lucky day. Tim's son threw aside the ragged coat that he had used to get sympathy as a beggar, stood up and came to Yeshua. So what is it that you want me to do for you? I want you to help me to see, Lord! Your faith made it possible. You can leave now. And just like that, the man received his sight, but he did not leave. No, he too joined the disciples and became a follower of Yeshua himself. When they were on the outskirts of Jerusalem, near the villages of Bethpage and Bethany, Yeshua and the company traveling with him came to the Mount of Olives. Yeshua spoke to two of his disciples. Go into that village over there. As soon as you enter it, you'll see a young, unbroken donkey. Untie him and bring him to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say that its owner needs it and they'll let you have it. So they went and found the young donkey tied up outside the door of a building at an intersection. Some people who were standing there asked why they were taking the animal and they said what Yeshua had told them to say. And it worked. They brought the colt to Yeshua and put their coats on it. Then Yeshua sat on it. Many others laid their coats in front of the donkey to be walked on. Others broke palm branches off trees and laid them on the ground too. Some led the way and others followed Yeshua. They were all shouting, Hosanna! Praise God! Make way! Yahweh's messenger has arrived! Blessings on our Messiah! This is King David's brother, son! Sing praises to God in heaven! Hosanna! After entering Jerusalem, Yeshua went into the temple and looked around, taking note of what was happening. When the sun had set, he and the others left the temple and returned to Bethany for the night. The next morning, they left Bethany without having had breakfast. Seeing a fig tree in the distance with many leaves on it, Yeshua went there, hoping to find some figs. But it wasn't time yet for it to bear fruit. Yeshua was angry at the tree. That's it! You've had your chance! Now you will never bear fruit again. His disciples saw him do this. They walked on into the city, and then Yeshua went into the temple and started a small riot. He chased out anyone who was buying or selling in there. 
and he turned over the tables that the money changers were using. He kicked over the chairs of some people who were selling doves and would not let people carry anything. It says in the law that Yahweh's house should be a place where people from any country can come to pray. But by doing all your business here in the temple, you have turned it into a den of thieves. The religious leaders heard it and they were more determined than ever to destroy him. But they feared him because so many people had become convinced that he was right in what he was saying. That night, Yeshua and his disciples went back to Bethany. Then, the next morning, when they entered Jerusalem for the third time, they saw that the fig tree that Jesus had cursed the morning before had dried up and died. Hey, teacher, look. That fig tree you cursed, it's up and withered away. Trust Yahweh. That's the key. I'm telling you, if you are acting in total faith in Yahweh and you happen to tell this mountain to go jump in the lake and you believe it is going to happen, it will happen. Whatever you say will happen. It is why I say that whatever Yahweh puts on your heart when you are praying, you should believe it will happen and it will. But when you pray, you should forgive anyone who has hurt you if you want your Heavenly Father to forgive you. If not, then you cannot expect to be forgiven by Yahweh. When they reached the city, Yeshua went into the temple again. But a delegation of religious leaders located him there and challenged him. What authority do you have for what happened here yesterday? Yeah, and who told you to behave like that? I have a question for you. And if you answer it, I will tell you by what authority I did what I did. John the Baptizer's ministry. Was it from Yahweh? Or was it just his own self-promotion? Answer that one. If we say his authority came from heaven, the people will ask why we didn't believe the rest of what he said. Yes, but you know what they will do if we say it did not come from Yahweh. They feared the masses, who all believed that John was a genuine prophet of Yahweh. Well, we cannot say with certainty whether John was genuine or not. Fair enough. So neither can I say by what authority I did what I did. Then Yeshua told a story. There was a man who owned a vineyard with a strong fence around it, a watchtower and a winery. He rented it out to people who would run the business while he himself was away in another country. When the harvest was in, the man sent a servant to collect the rent for the vineyard. But the people in charge beat him up and sent him back empty-handed. The owner sent another servant and he was wounded in the head when the men from the vineyard threw stones at him. He too returned to where the owner was. The third person who tried to collect the rent was killed, and many others were sent after that. Some were beaten and others were killed. The owner of the vineyard had one special son, his only son, whom he loved very much. He believed that if the tenants saw him, they would have more respect and they would hand over the rent. But the tenants thought differently. This is the owner's only heir. If we kill him, he might give up. And we will have the vineyard all to ourselves. So they killed the owner's son and threw his body outside the property. Now what do you suppose the owner of the vineyard would do when he hears about that? Won't he come and destroy those tenants and find new ones? Have you never read the scripture about Yahweh taking the stone which the builders rejected and making it the chief cornerstone of the building? And did you read about how it was such a powerful and dramatic decision that it startled everyone when it happened? Well, the religious leaders knew that Yeshua was talking about them and they wanted more than ever to arrest him. But still they were afraid of the crowds, so instead they just skulked away. But they sent others, including some who supported the unscriptural Jewish king Herod, to badger him with more questions. Teacher, we are impressed with your courage to speak the truth without favour to anyone, no matter how powerful they are. So, we have a question for you. Is it right, according to the Torah of course, to pay taxes to the Roman Emperor should we pay them or should we not? Yeshua knew what they were up to and so he said, Why are you trying to trick me? Get a coin and show it to me. Someone produced a coin and showed it to Yeshua. 
whose picture and whose writing is on this coin? Why, <laughs> Caesar's, of course. So give to Caesar what belongs to him, but give Yahweh what belongs to Yahweh. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> nice one. Then a religious leader that did not believe in the resurrection came and asked, Teacher, the Torah says that if a man's brother dies, leaving his widow but no children, then it is the duty of the brother to impregnate his brother's widow so she will have a child. Suppose that there was a family with seven brothers. The first one died, leaving his wife with no child. The second brother took her as his wife, but he too died without getting her pregnant. The same thing happened with the third. In the end, all seven were married to her at some point, but without any child being born. Then the woman died. If there is a resurrection, then which one would be her husband in heaven? You have misunderstood the scriptures and misunderstood Yahweh. There is no marriage in heaven. Everyone is like the angels, neither male nor female. But as for whether there is life after death, have you read in the Torah where Yahweh spoke to Moses in the burning bush? He said that he was being worshipped by Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. A dead person cannot worship Yahweh, only people who are alive. Can you see how you missed that? An expert on the Torah had been listening, and he was impressed with the answers that Yeshua gave. So he asked, Which commandment in the Torah do you think is the most important one? The first of all the commandments is this one. Listen, Israel, God does not share his throne with anyone. You must love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That, my friend, is the number one commandment. But the second is similar, which is this. You must love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. There is no other rule that is greater than these two rules. The Torah expert was impressed. Oh, very good, Master. You have spoken the truth. For there is only one God, and to love Him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your soul, and with all your strength is far more important than all of the other rules about burnt offerings and sacraments. When Yeshua saw that this man was not being argumentative like the other religious leaders, he was impressed. You're not far from being able to see the kingdom that I've come to build. After that, no more religious leaders dared to ask him any further questions. While still teaching there in the temple, Yeshua used a question of his own to make a point. You Torah experts say that the Messiah will be a descendant of King David. Yet, the Spirit of Yahweh caused David to say of this coming Messiah, Yahweh said to my Lord, Sit here on my right hand until I make your enemies into your footstool. Do you hear that? David called the Messiah his Lord. Would he say such a thing about someone who is merely his great-great-grandson? The crowds loved what they were hearing, and so Yeshua decided to take his teaching a step further. Watch out for these so-called Torah experts. They love to dress up and be given fancy titles. They expect special recognition in their religious meetings and being given the best seats at festivals. And they rip off widows and other gullible women. And they pretend to be spiritual by praying long prayers. These are the ones who will be punished the most by Yahweh. Yeshua was sitting near the place where people contributed money to the temple treasury. And he saw a lot of rich Jews competing to outgive one another there. Then a poor widow came in and she dropped two very small coins into the collection box. He signaled his disciples and spoke to them. I'm telling you the truth. This poor widow gave more than any of the others. They were only making token contributions. The bulk of what they owned, they kept for themselves. But she forsook everything she had. Yahweh doesn't look at what you give. He looks at what you have left. As they were leaving the temple, one of his disciples exclaimed, Teacher, have you ever noticed the beauty and the grandeur of the stones in this temple complex? John, these buildings that you see here are soon going to be destroyed. 
There won't be one stone left on top of another. That was all, and then they moved over to the Mount of Olives, where Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to Yeshua privately. Will there be a sign just before it all starts to happen? Be careful. Don't let anyone deceive you. Before I return, there will be many other leaders, all claiming to be anointed by Yahweh, and they will deceive many with their talk. When you hear about wars and threats of wars, don't be troubled by that. Wars will happen, but that is not how the world is going to end. Country will always rise up against other countries, and one empire against other empires. There will, however, be earthquakes all over the world, and famines, and other troubles. But even these will signal only the start of sad times for everyone. As for you, my followers, you're going to be dragged before the church councils. You will be beaten in their religious buildings, and you will be brought before kings and presidents because of your faith and as a testimony against them. But before it can all happen, this gospel that I've been preaching to you must be preached in every country on earth. When they finally arrest you and take you to court, don't worry about what to say. Whatever comes out of your mouth at the time will be good enough. Just let the words flow, because they will be coming from the Holy Spirit and not from your own human reasoning. Brothers will betray brothers to death, and fathers will betray their own children. Children will rise up against their parents and will cause them to be put to death. Because of your faith in me, everyone will hate you. But only those who stay faithful to the end are the ones who will be saved. The prophet Daniel talked about the abomination that makes the world desolate. He said it will be put somewhere where it should not be. If you can work out where that is, and if you see it happening, then you know it is time to flee into the mountains. If you're on the porch, do not even go back into the house to pack anything before fleeing. If you're working in a field, do not even go back to where you left your coat before you flee. It will be hardest for pregnant women or women with nursing babies at that time. Pray that your escape does not happen in winter, because the suffering will be worse than it has ever been from the creation of the world until that time, or even at any time in the future after it. If the Lord had not set a limit on how long the suffering should last, no one on earth would have survived. But for the sake of the ones whom He has chosen, those whom He has elected, for their sake He has set a limit on how long the time of great trouble will last. If anyone tells you, the Anointed One is here, or the Anointed One is there, don't believe them. There will be so many people falsely claiming to be anointed by Yahweh, and so many people making false prophecies, and so many preachers pretending to do miracles, that if it were possible, they would even deceive the ones who have chosen to put Yahweh first. So be on guard. I have told you this in advance, so that you will be prepared. At that time, that is, after the tribulation, the sun and the moon shall be clouded over, stars will fall, and even the earth's orbit will be shaken. That is when they will see me coming from heaven, with great power and glory, I will send my angels in all directions to gather all those whom I have chosen to save from throughout the whole earth. Here's another lesson from the fig tree. When leaves start to appear on the branches, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see the things happening that I just mentioned, you will know that my return is near, that I am knocking at your door. I'm telling you the truth. The people alive at the time when these things happen will not all die before everything will be finished. Right now, no one knows when that will be. Not the angels in heaven, not me, only the Father. So pay attention, watch for the signs and pray for wisdom so that you will know when it is about to happen. I am like someone leaving on a very long journey who has left servants in charge of his house. I have given responsibilities to each of you. I am telling you to stay awake, for you do not know if I will come early in the evening, at midnight, in the middle of the night, or maybe even early the next morning. You definitely do not want me to find you sleeping when I get here. What I am saying to you now 
I am saying to everyone who comes after you, stay awake. It was still two days until the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The religious leaders and Torah experts were frantically trying to find a way to arrest Yeshua secretly. They wanted to have him executed, but they wanted to do it before the Sabbath for fear his execution might cause a riot whenever it happened. Yeshua was back in Bethany once again, staying with a leper named Simon who lived there. They were eating when a young woman came into the room with a valuable container of perfume. She opened it and poured the perfume on Yeshua's head. Some of those present were shocked at such waste. Why wasn't this sold? She could have received a year's wages for it, and then we could have given it to the poor rather than wasting it like this. Where did she get that? What a waste! Someone needs to rein her in. She's obviously unstable. Let her alone. Why are you making trouble for her? What she has done is a good thing. You will always have poor people whom you can help, but I am about to leave you. She has done what she could to show love before I am dead and buried. I'm telling you the truth. Wherever people hear our message, everywhere in the world, they will tell this story and people will remember her and what she has done. That seemed to be the last straw for Judas because he went straight to the top priests and offered to help them find Yeshua in a situation where he would be on his own. The priests were overjoyed to hear from him and promised to give him money if he could help them. So Judas began looking for a good chance to betray Yeshua. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Jews killed the Passover lamb. Yeshua's disciples asked him what they should do about it. Where do you want us to prepare the meal so we can eat Passover together? Two of you can go into Jerusalem where you'll meet a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes, tell the owner of the house the teacher wants to know where there is a room for him to eat the Passover meal with his disciples. He will show you a large, furnished, upstairs room which has already been prepared for us. The two of them went into the city and found everything just like Yeshua had said. And so they prepared the Passover for the others in that upstairs room. That evening, Yeshua and his closest followers came there to eat. You may not believe this, but one of you who is eating with me right now is going to betray me. That worried all of them, and one by one, they asked if he was talking about them. It is one of you twelve, one who dunked his bread in the same gravy in which I dunked my bread. What is going to happen is going to happen, but it will be terrible for the one who betrays me. It would have been better if he had never been born. During the meal, Yeshua took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave some to each of them. Take this and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup of wine. When he had thanked Yahweh for it, he gave it to his disciples, and they all drank from it. This is my blood, which will be poured out for many people. It symbolizes Yahweh's true fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. I will drink no more wine until the day I drink with you in this new eternal kingdom. They sang a hymn together and then went out to the Mount of Olives. You are all going to be disappointed with me tonight, and you will leave me. As the scriptures have said, when the shepherd is killed, the sheep will scatter. But remember this, after I have risen, I will meet you back in Galilee. Lord, even if your mothers leave you, I won't. You think so? Peter, before the rooster has crowed two times tonight, you're going to deny that you even know me, Three times. Peter became even stronger in his claim. No, I'm serious. Even if they was to kill me, I wouldn't turn on you. Not even in the tiniest way. And the same goes for me. Me too. They all promised not to leave him. They finally reached a place called Gethsemane. Sit here while I go off and pray. Yeshua took Peter, James and John with him. He was obviously going through great anguish over what lay ahead. My heart is breaking. I feel like I'm about to die. Please stay with me and watch. He was only a short distance away when he fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, he might not have to go through with what lay ahead. Daddy, please. You can do anything. Please don't ask me to do this. But 
If it is what you want, I'll do it. He came back to the three and found them asleep. Peter, Simon, are you asleep already? Could you not stay awake with me for even one hour? Pray that you won't fall asleep again. For all your talk, you're a lot weaker than you think. He went off and prayed much the same thing a second time. And when he returned, they were asleep again. They hadn't been getting much sleep since arriving in Jerusalem. They didn't know what to say to him in their own defense. When this happened a third time, Yeshua more or less gave up on them. Sleep on. You need some rest. But it's too late now. They are already on their way here. Wake up. We have to go. The one who has betrayed me is coming. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with an angry crowd that had been put together by the religious leaders. Many of them were carrying swords and heavy sticks. Judas had told the priests that he would kiss Yeshua so that they could identify him in the dark. They had hoped to be able to lead Yeshua away peacefully, without a battle. So Judas went straight to Yeshua, saying, Teacher, teacher! And he kissed him. That is when they grabbed Yeshua and held him. One of the disciples pulled out a knife and swung at a servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Did you really think you would need swords and staves to take me, like I am a robber or some other criminal? Each day I have been openly teaching in the temple, and you made no move to take me there. But that's okay. This is the part where all my friends run away from me. One follower was grabbed by the only piece of clothing that he had, and to get away, he had to let go of the cloth and run away naked. Meanwhile, Yeshua was marched over to the house of the high priest, where a crowd of other religious leaders had also gathered. Peter followed from a distance, up to the home of the high priest. He sat and warmed himself by a fire, along with some workers from the house. Inside the house, the leaders tried to prepare a case against Yeshua, but everyone kept disagreeing over what it was that he had done that was so wrong. Some said, falsely, that Yeshua had threatened to destroy the temple and make another one in just three days without using his hands to do it. Even with these witnesses, there were inconsistencies. Don't you have anything to say for yourself? You are being accused of of all sorts of things. Are you just going to sit there and say nothing? But Yeshua kept his mouth shut and said nothing. Are you the promised Messiah? Are you the blessed son of Abraham? I am. One day you will see me and my kingdom coming down from heaven. The high priest tore at his robe in disbelief. Do we need any further evidence than that? You have heard his blasphemy. What do you say? Guilty! Blasphemy! Guilty! Guilty! Blasphemy! Execute him! They began to spit on him, and they covered his face. And then one of the servants would hit him, and they would say, Go on, prophesy! Who hit you? Down below, Peter was still warming himself, and a young maid saw him. Hey, I know you. I saw you with him. Yeshua. Yeshua from Nazareth. No, he ain't no friend of mine. What you're saying don't make sense. Then Peter moved on to the porch and a rooster crowed. The maid saw him a second time while he was on the porch. Look, there he is again. He's one of them. No, honest, I'm not. You got me mixed up with someone else. A little while later, one of the men standing around with him spoke up too. (laughs) Ha ha! Listen to how he talks. He has a Galilean accent, same as the prisoner. Surely he is one of them. But Peter began to swear. Let Yahweh strike me dead if I'm lying. I don't know the man. Swear to Yahweh. Then the rooster crowed again. Peter suddenly remembered what Yeshua had said to him about him denying he knew Yeshua three times before the rooster had crowed twice. Peter was overwhelmed with sorrow and started to cry. (laughs) It was soon morning, and after counsel amongst themselves, the religious leaders tied Yeshua up and led him over to where Pilate was. Pilate came straight out and asked Yeshua, Are you the king of the Jews? That's what some people are saying. There were many other accusations that the chief priests made against Yeshua at that time too. 
But Yeshua refused to defend himself against them. Listen to what they're saying. Are you not going to defend yourself against any of it? But still, Yeshua said nothing, and Pilate was shocked by this. Now it was customary for Pilate to release one prisoner at the request of the people in recognition of their Passover celebrations. There was another prisoner, a murderer named Barabbas, who had been part of a riot against the government. A crowd had gathered and was shouting for Pilate to do as he usually did and release a prisoner. Give us it's a Passover! Free someone! Free someone! Give us a Passover! Give us a pardon! Give us a pardon! Would you like me to give you your king? He knew that Yeshua had only been brought to him because the religious leaders were jealous of him. But the leaders stirred up the crowd, making them forget about their Messiah and choose a violent rebel instead. No, not Yeshua. Ask for Barabbas. Barabbas was fighting for us. He's our real hero. We want we Barabbas. Want yes. Barabbas. Barabbas. We want Barabbas. Yes. We want Barabbas. Yes. We want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. You want Barabbas? But what about the man you were all praising just a week ago? What about your king? Kill him! We want Barabbas! We want Barabbas! Crucify him! Kill him? Why? What evil has he done? Kill him! Yeah! Kill him! We want Barabbas! Which is not you! Pilate was as easily intimidated by the crowds as the religious leaders had been and so he released Barabbas. Then he had Yeshua whipped and handed over to some soldiers to be executed. The soldiers took Yeshua into a hall called Praetorium, where other soldiers were gathered. Someone had made a crown out of thorns and put it on Yeshua's head, and they put a purple robe on him, pretending that he was a Jewish king. They made fun of him too. Hail Yeshua, the Jewish king. <laughs> the king of the Jews. What a joke. They hit him on the head with a stick. Then they took off the purple cloth and put his own clothes back on before leading him out to be executed. There was an African man named Simon who was visiting there in Jerusalem and they forced him to carry the cross. Simon was the father of two followers of Yeshua, Alexander and Rufus. They brought Yeshua to a place called Golgotha in Hebrew, which means the skull. Someone offered Yeshua wine mixed with myrrh, which is often used as a painkiller, but he refused. When they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes. It was about 9am when they did this. A sign at the top of the cross usually told what offence the prisoner was found guilty of, so the sign above Yeshua said, King of the Jews. Two robbers were also being crucified that same day with one of them on each side of Yeshua. This was fulfillment of a prophecy which said he would be seen as a criminal along with other criminals because of their association with each other. Members of the public shouted at him. Look at him! He was able to do miracles for other people. Yeah, why can't he even save himself? I heard him say he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, and now he's trapped. He can't even get down from there. <laughs> the religious leaders did much the same thing. Go on, you saved others. Why can't you save yourself, O oh mighty Messiah of Israel? Come down from there, then we will believe you. The other prisoners also shouted at him. Yeah, and while you're at it, get us down too. At noon, the sky turned dark, and it stayed that way for three hours. During that time, Yeshua cried out in agony. My God, my God, where are you? Why have you left me? Because the Aramaic word for my God is Eloi. Some people thought he was saying Eli. Listen, he's calling for Elijah to come and save him. Someone ran and filled a sponge with vinegar, then lifted it up to Yeshua's lips on a stick. Be quiet, maybe Elijah will come. But instead, Yeshua cried out in a very loud voice and he died. Ah, finished! At that very moment, the huge curtain that hung in front of the place where the Israeli people believed Yahweh lived was torn from top to bottom. 
a soldier who had watched all that had happened at the crucifixion, was deeply impressed. I think he really was God's son. In the distance were some women who had gathered to watch. Among them were Mary Magdalene, another Mary, who was the mother of James the Lesser and Joseph, and a woman named Salome. When Yeshua had been in Galilee, Salome had followed him and helped him in many ways. She was part of a group of women who had travelled to Jerusalem along with Yeshua and the others. When it was getting close to sunset, and because it was the day when the people prepared for the Passover Sabbath, a respected Jewish leader named Joseph from Arimathea boldly asked Pilate if he could take the corpse and bury it. Joseph was one of those who had hoped that Yeshua might be the promised Jewish king. Pilate was suspicious that Yeshua might not be already dead, so he confirmed it with the soldier in charge before giving the body to Joseph. Joseph had purchased some very fine linen, which he used to wrap the body after taking it down from the cross. Then he laid it in a cave-like tomb, which had been fashioned from solid rock. Another huge stone was rolled in front of the opening to the tomb. When the Sabbath was over, very early on Sunday morning, the two Marys and Salome gathered some sweet spices that they had bought between them with the intention of putting them on the corpse. The sun was just coming up when they approached the tomb. Oh dear, we forgot about the stone. It's too big for us to move in. How are we going to get into the tomb? But when they arrived, they saw that the stone, which was huge, had already been rolled back. When they stepped inside, they saw a man in a white robe sitting to the right of the door, and it frightened them. Please don't be frightened. I know that you are looking for Yeshua, the man from Nazareth who was crucified. I just want you to know that he is alive. He has left. Look, that is where they put him. Go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going to return to Galilee. You will all see him there as he had promised. The women ran out of there with mixed emotions. They were frightened and hopeful at the same time. At first they said nothing to anyone. They were too afraid. The first person who saw Yeshua personally was Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had chased seven evil spirits. After seeing him for herself, she went and told those who had been travelling with him who were still crying and mourning his death. When they heard that he was alive, they refused to believe it. Later, Yeshua appeared in a different form to two more of them as they were walking on a road away from the city. They too came and told the others, but they were not believed either. Finally, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were eating. He was cranky with them for not believing when the others had told them that he was alive. Now I want you to go into all the world and tell everyone on earth the good news that I've been sharing with you these past few years. If they believe you, they will be baptized with my spirit and they will be saved. But if they do not believe you, they will be damned. Miracles will happen after they believe you. On my behalf, they too will drive out bad spirits and speak new languages. They'll pick up snakes and if they drink anything that is dangerous, it will not hurt them. They will nurse sick people and the people they nurse will recover. After Yeshua had said this, he ascended up into the sky where he now sits next to Yahweh. His disciples went out from there, preaching this good news all over the known world. Yahweh has worked with followers of Yeshua as they have preached, confirming to the general public that what they say has really come from Yahweh. And so it has. <laughs>